This morning, actually, when I got up, I was thinking we will have a kind of a discussion. But when I was waiting upon the Lord, the Lord put into my heart a word that I need to share with you. And that is what I want you all to listen very carefully from the word of God. Turn with me to the second last book of the Bible, the book called Jude. There is only one chapter there, Jude, and we are going to read verse 20, 21, 22, and 23. The second last book of the Bible, the book before Revelation, there is only one chapter, so you might actually miss it. It is after 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. There are only 25 verses there, so there are chances you might miss it. Anyone who doesn't have a Bible, Please let me know. We have more Bibles at the back. All right. Jude verses 20 to 23. Wilfred, would you please read? Listen carefully as Wilfred reads it. Thank you. But you, dear friends, by building yourself up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy, mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. All right. Thank you, Wilfred. So the title for today's message will be Standing Until Eternity. If you're writing it down, you can write it down. Standing Until Eternity. Now one thing that we need to remember as I keep saying it, we are all in a journey as children of God who have given their life to Jesus. We know that our journey is not going to end with this world. We are waiting for something beyond. There is life after death. We believe that. We preach that. In the gospel meetings and conventions we have, we declare that there is life after death. This is not the end of it. So as children of God, if we have to reach that eternal life with Jesus, we have to stand firm till the end of our life. And this book, the book of Jude, is written in a particular context. What this writer Jude is writing from verse number 20 onwards has a background. Quickly, I will say that today we started a little late because we came a little late, so we might exceed by 10 minutes. Please bear with me. So what Jude is writing here, when Jude you know, wanted to write this letter, he wanted to write about the salvation of God through Jesus Christ his son. That is what he wanted to basically write. But then he suddenly realizes that in the church and some people outside the church whom basically we can identify as false teachers, people who teach wrong doctrines, who teach the wrong teachings, some of these individuals are trying to tell the people in the church that once you have given your life to Jesus, you are covered by the grace of God and therefore you can keep sinning. No matter what happens, you can keep sinning and whatever happens, God is going to take care of you. So what we hear today as grace theology is not a new theology. It was already there even at that time. And this thought came through these false teachers who were basically trying to tell the people, I've said this before, that the knowledge of human beings can reach to the level of the knowledge of God. That is what the Gnostics, we study Gnosticism, that is what they thought. The knowledge of human beings can grow and grow and grow and it can come to the level of God's knowledge. So they thought once an individual grows in their knowledge, grows in their knowledge, grows in their knowledge, comes to the knowledge level of God, even if they fall in sin, it's okay. They're not going to lose their eternity. That is what these false teachers were teaching. That is why when Jude is writing this, he is writing in verse number 5. Can it all turn to verse number 5? 
I will read it for you. It says, Now I desire to remind you, though you are fully informed, that the Lord, who once for all saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Then he says, And the angels, who did not keep their own position, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains in the darkest, in the deepest darkness for the judgment of the great day. Verse number 7. Likewise, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which in the same manner as they indulge in all more immorality and pursued unnatural lust, serve an as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So Jude is saying, these people, the people who came out of Egypt and the heavenly angels and also the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, they started their journey well. They were going well. Everything was fine. So if you think that because you are standing in God, and then anything wrong happens in the society or in the community or you stand against God and God is not going to punish you or God is not going to take away eternity, then you're wrong. So he gives the example of these three. He says the example of the people who came out of, uh, of Egypt. Then he says the example of the angels. And he takes the example of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and say, just like they gave up, they fell in sin. They did wrong things. If God did not spare even the angels, how can we come to a conclusion and say that I can do whatever I want after coming to the Lord? Are you with me? Hello? Am I confusing? Simple and very I'm trying to be very simple. So that is what Jude is saying. And then he speaks a lot of things down. He gives the example of Cain. He gives the example of Balaam. He gives the example of Korah. And he's trying to explain that when you see all these things, as, the, as Brother Matthew was saying, there are individuals who stand against us. When we see all the things happening around us, we should not become weaker, but we become, should become stronger in the Lord. Knowing that Christ Jesus died for our sins on the cross. If Jesus had not died on the cross for us, we would still be sinners. Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. We were supposed to die. We were supposed to have eternal life. But because Jesus died on the cross for us, we have a reason to look forward to that eternity. But just like the people who came out of Egypt, just like the angels, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, the people therein, as they started well, but through the process of life, they gave it up. And if God destroyed them, we cannot take our salvation for granted. Are you with me? Alright, so that is what he is trying to explain. And then he goes down and comes to verse number 17. There are a lot of things that I don't have time to go through. But come to verse number 17. He says, but you beloved must remember the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. For they said to you, in the last days, there will be scoffers indulging their own, indulging in their own ungodly lust. It is these worldly people devoid of the Spirit. If you have your pens, you can underline that. Devoid of the Holy Spirit. Devoid of the Spirit who are causing divisions. See, as Paul is coming down, he's saying, listen to me, brothers. <clears throat> there are people in this world whom we can properly term worldly people. What is the definition of godly people? Hello? What is the definition of godly people? Simple de definition based on this, what we are reading. Definition of godly people? Those who have the spirit of God in them are called godly people. And those who don't have the spirit of God in them are 
worldly people. That is what Paul is saying. It is these worldly people, devoid of the spirit, who are causing divisions. So if you have the spirit of God in you, and how do you identify that you have the spirit of God in you? How do we identify? When we commit something wrong, when we do something wrong, the Holy Spirit convicts us, talks to us, as brother was saying, disciplines us, reminds us, you have done something wrong, you have spoken something wrong, you need to go and say sorry, you need to come to God and say God, we are sorry. So that is what the Holy Spirit does. But here these people, they have lost that. The Holy Spirit is not there in them. It is devoid. It, they, are, they are without the Holy Spirit. And therefore, they are worldly people. And they are the ones who are causing divisions. They are the ones who are causing problems. So if in any place, whether in an office, whether in our family, whether in our, uh, in our church, whether in our, in our flat or in our friend circle, if we indulge in any kind of dividing talks that will bring divisions, that means we are devoid of the Holy Spirit. Yesterday, I heard a wonderful message. It might sound a little strange. I was here even on the way to um, pick Bondi in the evening. And me and Brother Anil, we were playing that in the, in the car. The man of God is saying, today, people find great joy and passion in spreading WhatsApp messages. Now if we find something, a small clip comes destroying someone or saying something bad about them or something, we just forward it. So this man of God was saying, and I, I'm quoting this man of God. It's not my words, it is what this man of God said. It is then Malayalam on, on my mobile. This man of God was saying, those people who spread bad news and spoil the reputation of others, they will not go to heaven. And he said, why? Because they don't have the spirit of a father and mother in them. They don't have the spirit of a father and mother in them. Because the spirit of a father and mother will not like to highlight to the society the weakness of their children. Are you with me? So this man of God was saying, if you are doing this, can any one of you guarantee and tell me that after 5 years or 10 years or 15 years when my children grow up, they will not fall in sin. They will not end up doing something wrong. So this man of God was saying, so there are people, they have weaknesses, they fail in life. But rather than crucifying them, we need to cover them up and encourage them to come out of their wrong ways. If we do that, years from now, if our children fall in sin, God will help them. This is what this man of God said. I, I really liked it. So what I'm trying to say is, whatever divisions or things or all these things happen, the Jude is saying, these people have lost the godly spirit. We may find such people in the society. Let's do one thing. Let TSA do one thing. We'll pray for such people. Rather than crucifying them, rather than criticizing them, let's take a decision that we'll pray for such people. But Paul, but Jude, after writing this much, in verse number 20, is saying, But you, beloved, you know, from verse number 17 onwards, he has spoken about the people, the worldly people. He comes to the godly people and says, But you, beloved, build yourselves up on the most holy faith. So what should we do to stand until eternity? Number one, Jude says, he, that's actually written in the beginning itself, verse number 17, you must remember the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is number one. And what are the predictions? The early apostles, the disciples, all of them unanimously in one voice said, Jesus Christ will come back one day. That is a great prediction. So we have to stand until eternity knowing that Jesus will come. One day he will come. Just as he went, the same way he will come back. 
These are the predictions of the apostles, the prophecy of the apostles, the, the words of the apostles. So number one, to stand in the eternity, what do we need to do? We have to remember the predictions of the of the pastors, of the apostles, apostles of the New Testament. Secondly, he's saying, verse number 20, build yourselves up in the most holy faith. So what is actually Jude saying? As for you brothers and sisters, you should do one thing. You need to have a common faith. You need to stand up and say, whoever is speaking wrong things, whoever are trying to cause divisions, you as brothers and sisters, as beloved of the Lord, you should have a common faith saying that what these people are talking is wrong, what the apostles taught is right. Hello, are you with me? Yeah? What these people, there are a lot of people who are teaching a lot of wrong things in the world today. Even in churches and Lord through YouTube and all, a lot of wrong things are being taught, a lot of heresies and a lot of false teachings are there. But Jude is saying to the believers, let them do what they are doing. But as for you, my beloved, you need to stand together in common faith. And that faith should be built upon what Jesus taught and what the apostles taught. Hello? Are you with me? Yeah? So that is the second thing. So what happens if we, how do we build a common faith? How do we build a holy faith? That's an interesting question. As for brothers and sisters, we can do one thing. If in our midst there are brothers and sisters who are weak in their faith, who are at the point of, I just wanted to speak it as we go down, but the Spirit of the Lord urges me to just remind it right away. There may be brothers and sisters in our midst who are, who have just you know, lost and they're just falling apart, who are becoming weak in their faith. Well, how can we help them? When you meet that brother or sister, don't talk worldly things, talk godly things. Hello? Talk about the word of God. Encourage them. Strengthen them. I always go back to that example. In the book of Daniel, when King Nebuchadnezzar, he saw a dream. And he was troubled and in the end he called all his magicians and dream, you know, all the, all the, all the uh, people who would interpret the dream, everyone. And no one could get satisfy him with an answer. He decided to kill everyone. All these astrologers and all these, all these magicians and enchanters he wanted to kill. At that time, Daniel comes there. What does Daniel say to him? Give me some time. I want some time. And then he goes to his friends, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And what do they start talking? About yesterday's basketball match? About yesterday's cricket match? No, what are they talking? They started praying to God. They started talking how God Almighty can come and rescue us in this situation. They started praying with each other. They started encouraging each other. And finally God revealed to Daniel the meaning of the dream. So that is what we need to do. If we are weak in a situation, we cannot move forward. If a brother or sister is weak, find them out. Talk to them. Encourage them. By doing that, two things will happen. Number one, that person's faith will increase and your faith will also increase. Number one. Number two, that person's biblical knowledge will increase. Our biblical knowledge will also increase. So if I have to talk, if I have to encourage someone, I need to know what? Bible. So if I start reading, I have to say, okay, God, today I have to talk to that brother. And so I have to talk something. I'm going to read the Bible and find something. I go and share with him. Then when he is encouraged, I'm also encouraged. Next day I want to share something more with him. So that person is also being built up. You are also being built up. Are you with me? Hello, how many are sleepy? Everyone is okay? Okay. So it says you have to encourage. You have to talk. So how do we, how do we build a common ground? By talking, by encouraging, by, by speaking to individuals and building up a common faith. Common understanding. Okay, then Paul, uh, Jude, I always keep saying Paul. Jude goes down and says, 
Pray in the Holy Spirit. Underline that if you have your Bible. Pray in the Holy Spirit. What does it mean? It means if I pray in my spirit, sometimes I may have the tendency of praying unwanted things. I may have the tendency of praying my selfish prayers. But if I pray in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will remind me the heart of God. And what is there in the heart of God? You see, in the Bible, time and again, when children of God have been confronted with problems and issues, and when they have prayed, they are not simply praying, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, bless Daddy, bless Mommy. That is not a prayer. Bless my job. Let my salary come on time. That is okay. Nothing wrong with that. But when they are praying, they are always reminding God of His greatness. If you see the prayer of Daniel, you see that. He's reminding God of His greatness. Doesn't God know how great He is? God knows it, right? God knows it. But why is Daniel saying and telling God His greatness? Because Daniel wants God to know that Daniel knows that God is great. Right? For example, if your boss has done something good for you, what do you do? You go to say to him and say, thank you sir. Yes or no? If I write in a piece of paper and put it in my pocket, when I go, my boss will see within my pocket. Does it work that way? No. You will go and say, thank you sir. In the same way, that boss will understand he is thankful for what I have done for him. In the same way, Daniel is trying to show now, God, you know how well I know you. You know that I praise you, that I worship you, that you are a mighty God. So when it says pray in the Holy Spirit, it means stop praying in your spirit. Start praying in God's spirit. Because when we start praying in our spirit, sometimes we will have selfish prayers. We all are selfish, isn't it? We all are selfish. We all are selfish. I, I always say, you know, uh, there are a lot of people who will say, I will stand for Jesus till the end of my life. Whatever happens, I will not give up. You know, it is easy to say. But in reality, stand, think, if I'm standing here, and suddenly someone comes with a sword or with a knife, and says, I'm going to kill this small child, deny your Christ, what will you do? And if that small child is your own child, even if outrightly you don't deny Christ, you start bargaining Christ. Isn't it? See, please don't do that. Let, let me tell what I am. Please, Christ is this. Let me start. It is not very practically that situation comes. I will tell you how. There are a lot of people who say, I don't fear surgery. I don't fear. Right at the moment of the surgery, doctor will say, his PP is high. His sugar is high. We cannot do the surgery. No. So it's easy to say, but very difficult. But what Paul is saying, what, what Jude is saying is, listen, pray in the heart of God. Ask God, God, I don't know how to pray in the Holy Spirit. Teach me how to pray in the Holy Spirit. And when you completely give yourself in the hand of God, you keep silent, God will start putting words in your mouth. God will start telling you what you need to pray. And you will start praying. And then, when we read down, you know, there are a lot of things I quickly want to move. It says, keep yourself in the love of yourself. Is it what it says? Love of? I know, verse number 21. Is it written only in my Bible? What is it written? Keep yourself in the love of God. Don't start loving yourself. So we are talking about standing till eternity. Number one, remember the predictions of the apostles. Number two, what we have to do is what, what he says here, have a, have, a, have a common faith, a foundation. Let your life build, be built upon holy faith. Number three, pray the Holy Spirit. Number four, he is saying is, listen, keep yourself in the love of God. Like in Hindi we say, tan, man, or dan, usego. Your mind, spirit, soul, your finances, your job, everything, give it unto God. Not to us. Love of God. Let us love God more than anything. 
Let us love God more than anything. Let me sing the song. Lord, I need you more than anything else. More than air, more than bread, more than anything. I need you. That is why Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's benefit. So what is Paul saying? Paul says, if I am living, I will live loving Christ. If I die, it is more better. Why? I will go to be with him. See his passion. That is what is the meaning of having ourselves in the love of God. Let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, it is easy to give up love. It is easy. We, when, remember, I always we think together, you know, including me, I'm not preaching just for you, it's including me. When we gave our life to Jesus, when we became believers, when we took baptism, oh, what passion we had. What passion we had. What love we had. Now all of that has become lesser and lesser and lesser. Isn't it? It has become lesser. Just think, when we started going for a new job, how punctual we were. And when we see someone, hello, sir. Hello, madam. We were so, now we are a little more relaxed, isn't it? Am I wrong? And we are a little more relaxed. Why we think that we are permanent here? That girl, Jude is saying, whatever happens, never compromise with the love of God. Other things will come. The love of money will come. The love of our you know, family will come. We need to have importance for everything. But nothing should be more than loving God. Let us be people who will get up every morning and say, Lord, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Let that be a motto. Then it goes down and says, in the love of God, next, look forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Hello? Look forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So what did Jude say? My brothers and sisters, even if you remember the predictions of the apostles, even if you uh, stand in love, even if you pray in the Holy Spirit, even if you have common faith, if your life is built upon holy faith, if everything is there, still, if you don't have the mercy of God, that leads to eternal life. God, cut up, finish. So all these things are important, but what is more important is to keep pleading for God's mercy. You know, my father always says this, no matter how righteous a person is, if he has to reach heaven, God has to have mercy. How righteous a person is. If he has to reach heaven, God has to have mercy. God will have to have grace. If God does not have grace, I think heaven will be empty. Isn't it? God has to have mercy. God has to have compassion. And that is what Jude is saying. What should we do? You should keep Look forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Say to him, Lord, I need so much of your mercy. That is what we were praying this morning. We need compassion. We need mercy. Lord, I am a human being. I am no supernatural person. I can have weakness. I can have failures. But Lord, this I pray to you. Despite all the goodness in me, keep me safe till the eternal life. Let your mercy be upon me. Having said all this, there are a lot of things down I don't have time to go. Verse number 22. It says, And have mercy on some who are wavering. Let me quickly finish that. What is Jude saying? You see, there are some people. What is the main wavering? Eh? Not stable. Open niche. Up and down. Should I do? Should I not do? Should I do? Should I not do? Is God good? Is not God good? Is God good? Not? They're always wavering. They're not, they're not sure. So what is Jude saying? Please have mercy on those who are wavering. What is the meaning, as I said earlier? Those who are not firm in their faith, have mercy on them. Go and talk to them. Tell them, brother, don't give up. God will do it. He did it for David. He did it for Elijah. He did it for Elisha. He will do it for you. Go and encourage them. Have mercy on them. See, if I am, if I am in water and I'm about to drown, what will I expect? I will expect someone to see me and have mercy on me. Isn't it? If I don't know how to swim. Even the best of swimmers sometimes drown in water. 
So we are waiting for someone to have mercy in the same way we see someone else drowning. We need to have mercy upon them. That is what Jude is saying. Have mercy on those who are wavering for going up and down and up and down. Good. Sometimes not good. Have mercy on them. Secondly, he says, save others by snatching them out of the fire. So number one, have mercy on those people who are going up and down and up and down. Number two, he's saying, some people are already snatched and put in fire. Or are in the fire. What it means, actually what Jude is saying, he's trying to use an example of a, of a wooden piece, furniture, which is actually burning. So Jude is trying to say, just like a wooden piece is burning, you can put water and quench it or you can do something to stop the fire in the same way before it is completely burnt out. Have mercy and go and stop the fire. In the same way, there are some brothers and some sisters who are on the verge of giving up their race, falling into sin, doing some wrong things. Don't just leave them and stand and laugh and say, oh wow, well, this is God's reply. No, don't say that. Go and have mercy on them. Quench the fire. Quench the fire. And after having said that, Jude reminds one important thing. And if you have your pens, you have to underline. And it says, have mercy on still others, but with fear. Why? Because if something is on fire, if something is on fire, and if I go to quench or to stop the fire, there is every chance that fire can spread on me. Hello, are you with me? Therefore, with fear, God, I am going to help this person who is in sin. I want to bring this person out. But Lord, I pray that I will be victorious. I will be able to quench the fire, but the fire should not catch me. I should not fall into sin. I should not fall into temptation. I want to come out. I want to bring this person out. And I also want to come out and, and to, unde- to, 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 to emphasize that, what Jude is saying, hating even the tunic defined by their own flesh. Hating. It, how much you have to go with fear is the same way that you even hate the dirt that might come upon your dress from your own flesh. In the actual language of what is written, if the church permits me, I will speak. What is written, you know? Hating even the dirt that comes in your inner wear. That is the usage. So just when you see your inner wear is dirty and you just want to throw it away and put it for washing, in the same way, when you go to rescue a person who is falling into sin, who has been caught in fire into sin, you have to go with fear, hating not the person, but the sin. Hating not that person. Why? Because earlier you said you have to have mercy on them. But you have to hate the sin. Because if you don't hate the sin, the sin can catch you. Let me wind it up. And finally, he says, Verse number 24 and 25, everyone needs to have it underlined in your Bible. He says, now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, with glory, majesty, power and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. What did you say? Now to him who is able to keep you from falling. So you are saying, you are saying, God, I have fear. Yet at the same time, I want to have mercy on this person. When you have that fear and you want to have mercy on that person, it is not our own strength that will keep us from falling, but it is the grace of God. So if you don't fall into sin, let us not boast about it. But let us be thankful to the grace of God. If God has saved us, from committing something really bad and brought us out safely, let us be thankful for the grace of God. It is the grace of God, it says, that will keep you from falling. And it is the grace of God that will make you stand without blemish in the presence of God one day. How? With rejoicing. Let it not happen. Someday we go and stand before God and then we throw like this. Oh, 
I said, oh, okay, I'm here. No. You have to say, Lord, I'm thankful you brought me here. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your compassion. I was not worthy. But because of your grace, because of your mercy, here I stand in your presence. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That is what Judas said. That is what Judas said. So we, to be people who will stand until eternity, this is what Judas said. So let's not think that just because, you know, uh, we have given our life to Jesus, we can do anything. No. Paul reminds and says, grace is not a license for sinning. He says, and Jude here is saying, remember there are people who have fallen away. They thought everything is in their control, but they have fallen away. So don't take it for granted. Let us be able to stand until eternity, knowing the predictions of the apostles. What is the prediction? One day Jesus will come back. My brothers in the international city and my brothers and sisters who are here who are going through tough times in your life, let me tell you, the book of Revelation says, we are going to a place where there are no tears. Here, some, may, some people may be able to trouble you, but there, no one will trouble us. We are going to be with him forever and ever. Our pain will be taken away. Our sorrows will be taken away. Our tears will be taken away. And we will be in the presence of God Almighty forever and forever and ever. And the church together say, Amen. 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 Let's all stand up together. Look to the Lord in prayer. Can we pray? Lord, I want to stand until eternity. There's so many things that are happening in my life. Lord, how I wish that I will not give up into that sin that is tempting me. But I will stand strong. When the devil tempts me to speak bad things, I will hold myself, knowing that I am called to stand until eternity. When the devil tempts us to fall into some worldly sins, into, you know, all the worldly passions and the way the worldly people run. Into things that will destroy our body using alcohol or smoking and doing the wrong things, taking drugs with me, whatever it may be. I say, Lord, no, I don't want to fall because if I do that, I will hurt the Spirit of the Lord and therefore the Spirit of the Lord is not active in me. I will become a worldly man and no more a godly man. Therefore, Lord, give me the grace. I want to stand strong. I want to stand for you. How many of us want to offer that prayer this morning? Every eyes closed. How many of us want to offer this prayer? Can we lift our hands up to heaven? And say, Lord, this is my prayer. As Jude says, pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Tell him, Lord, I don't know what to pray. I don't even know how to pray. But let the Holy Spirit help me. And many don't have words to pray. Many don't have words to utter. Just do one thing. In the presence of God, go and just be silent and let God start, start talking to you. Let God start giving you the words to pray and the Holy Spirit will take complete control. And to that extent, let the hand of God and the mercy of God be upon each and every one of us. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for helping us to come and to, oh God, spend some time in your presence. Lord, we are so thankful to you. Lord, we are sorry that we began a little late. But Lord, still you have the grace upon us for us to reach here and be able to praise you and worship you. Thank you, Father, for all my precious brothers and sisters who are here. Fill them with your power. Fill them with your grace. And Lord, as Jude says, let us always remember, no matter what the world says, no matter what science says, no matter what big scientists will say, we are concerned about what the Bible says through the apostles that one day you will come back in glory. We believe that, Lord. Help us to hold on to that. Help us to believe that. Lord, help us to love God more than anything else, more than our job, more than our family, more than ourselves. Help us to love you. Help us, O oh God, to have a strong faith that would be, oh God, useful for each other. 
Help us to have a good holy faith that will be useful not just for us but for the brother or sister who is with us, who is working with us. People in our family, Lord Father. Help us to pray in the Holy Spirit. Lord, including me, many a times we pray selfish prayers. Only, only prayers that are memorized. Give us the unction and the urge to pray in the Holy Spirit. Praying, waiting upon the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray to you and in your great mercy and grace, you will help us, O God, to stand till eternity. Stand with rejoicing, not with blemish. Help us to stand with our heads held high. Forgive our shortcomings. Help us to live for you. Lord, we look forward to a week that will be filled with challenges. But Lord, we also thank you because you are greater than any challenge. You are greater than any problem. And Lord, when my dear brother and sister, when all of us go through trouble and tough times, hold us together. Hold us together in your compassion, in your mercy. That when we meet next week, we can declare the goodness of God in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. We bless your holy and mighty name. We thank you, we thank you. As we depart from here, send us with your blessings. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, we pray. Amen. amen and amen. Before I say the word of benediction, next Friday on, we will have the kids' class that will restart again. They were having a summer break. Now that break is over. Monday onwards, the school is starting. Friday onwards, their kids' class is going to start. And uh, may God bless you. And any one of you, uh, you know, if you are not in our group, please give your mobile number to my wife and we will love to add you in the group. Let's lift our hands up to heaven as we receive the words of benediction. Now may the love of God the Father, grace of His Son Jesus, and the sweetest fellowship of the Holy Spirit, abide with each and every one of us, even our brothers and sisters who could not come here today, and with all of God says across the world, till Jesus Christ comes back in His glory, and every children of God together say, Amen, Amen. Amen. We have snacks and those of you who...